New Zealand is a truly beautiful country. It's serene, peaceful, and more importantly, unlike its mate to the west, it doesn't have any snakes that can turn a nice trip out to the bush into the final thing you'll experience. But deep underneath the ground, chaos runs rampant. Tectonic plates are grinding against one another in the southern island, forming the spectacular southern alps. And in a northern island, an active subduction zone has led to massive volcanism that continuously reshapes the land. The reason I mention this is because New Zealand wasn't spared from the mega tsunami that was generated when a comet slammed into the Indian Ocean 5,000 years ago. But much of the evidence has either been erased or altered. Some parts of it, albeit to a rarer extent than most other countries, do have visible evidence in the form of directional chevrons that have been deposited by the mega tsunami wave after it retreated. But most parts of New Zealand that were in line with the epicenter of the comet impact are very mountainous for the reason I just mentioned. Two continental pieces of crust are currently colliding head on and the uplift that's being generated here is pronounced. Because of this, most of the coastline in the southern island is far higher than the 180 to 200 odd meter high mega tsunami wave that struck here. And as a result of this, much of this wave was broken up before it had a chance to wreak the same level of chaos and destruction that we witnessed in every other country we have visited. One thing to keep in mind is that New Zealand is constantly experiencing major earthquakes. These quakes alter the land and they can do so quite dramatically. So the area where the coastline is today might be different to where it was 5,000 years ago. As a result of this, we only have a few areas to look at in this video. I could do what I've done in the past and painstakingly read the mountains to demonstrate where the chevrons went. And if this is something you'd like to see, please let me know by hitting that like button. But regardless of that, the evidence that is present serves to further bolster the Burkle Crater impact theory, and thus are just as important to study as any other country that was affected by this truly cataclysmic event. There exists only a handful of places where obvious chevron depositions were laid down in New Zealand. Remember, the most pronounced and obvious versions of these depositions only occur in places that are relatively flat and easy to ascend. Whilst chevrons will still be present in places where the wave had to scale mountains, they will be scattered and hard to read. There are many factors to take into consideration when attempting to ascertain the hydrodynamics of the area. So for this reason, we'll take a look at the most obvious and detectable evidence which will be in places where a river flows out to the sea, or where the land is, for whatever reason, flatter than normal. If we take a look at the Burkle Crater epicenter over here, you can see that much of New Zealand was in fact in a direct firing line. The wave would have traveled around 8,600 kilometers to reach here, but the rugged mountains of the South Island protected much of the land. When this wave hit, it would have traveled upstream by following rivers and tributaries, but it wouldn't have made it too far, as the elevation here rapidly ascends to a point that renders the mega tsunami at its 200 meter height futile. The first place that we will visit is Stewart Island. Here, several areas show very clear chevron depositions that are intense enough to be visible on Google Earth. This is a very compelling bit of evidence and it's why I'm starting here. These aren't formed by wind, like I've said time and time again in this series, obviously. But here we have clear proof that they aren't. Because what we are looking at here is the line of convergence between two parts of the wave as it swept inland. You can see the sandy chevrons on the top of the island. They crashed into here, then flowed inland, following the topographical low point in between two mountain ranges. It will then sprawl out in all directions, whilst the bulk majority of it continued inland. This wave went all the way through the island and flowed out the other side. This can't be anything other than a tsunami wave, and a big one at that. A little further south, at Doughboy Bay, we see where the tsunami swept in, but it was ultimately prevented from going too far inland by the mountains here. But what did happen was the very clear deposition of chevrons. 
which when compared to the land on either side of it, really show just how foreign this is, as nothing that even remotely resembles this occur in places where the topographical height protected it from the wave. And this is probably one of the best places that I have found where this distinction exists. And in the southernmost section of the island, we have what appears to be erosion created by the scouring of bedrock whilst the wave passed over here. This is the only place on the island with these lines. Moving on to mainland New Zealand now, and in the southernmost tip, we find land that has been designated on mass for agriculture, meaning much of the chevrons that were here are now completely erased. The only thing that still exists to hint at what once occurred here are these tears in the cliffs along the coastline. But as we move further up, suddenly something pops out. The sandy outcropping in these hills. These are all chevrons. Here's a comparison to show you what the land looked like before the mega tsunami deposited them. Notice just how different the chevrons look compared to the natural features that erosion has carved into the mountains here over time. After this point, the flatland shifts into a mountainous one very abruptly. And you can see what I mean regarding the height of the mountains here. They're quite impressive. And you can also see why massive excavation works were undertaken to make the land in the southern tip arable for agriculture. As the southern Alps dominate this area of New Zealand and stretch to the northern tip of the South Island. The mega tsunami really didn't have the ability to do much here impact wise. So yeah, after this point, much of the land has been reshaped by humans or by nature itself. The chevrons are visible on the boundary between the shoreline and the cliff face everywhere, but they fail to scale beyond this. The next actual noteworthy bit of evidence occurs in the northern part of the South Island, beginning with these minor tears here. When we move up, this place is actually the chevrons deposited by the mega tsunami. Notice the direction. It lines up so perfectly with the epicenter of the Burkle Crater. We have another few chevron flows that are exposed to the north of this. And then after that, we reach the area of most destruction, at least for the South Island. This flat bit of land shows us what really happened here. And much like before, the direction so perfectly lines up with the crater. In the North Island, a steep rugged cliff face broke the direct wave here, but they are only around 60 meters high, generally speaking. So the wave definitely still swept inland. But as you can see, agriculture has reshaped the land here, leaving only the faintest evidence behind. Such as this place here, with some scarring and sandy outcrops. But yeah, farmland has literally dominated every stretch of land here, and it's no wonder, with the rich fertile volcanic soil being perfect for that purpose. So we need to take into consideration the fact that volcanism continues to reshape the land in the North Island, whether it be directly through lahars and pyroclastic flows, or indirectly through ashfall deposits. As you can see, this river system here, well, it's been slammed by past lahar flows. These aren't mega tsunami deposits, and they don't look like them either. Those would be well underneath this sediment layer. Lake Taupo, the supervolcano that's located on the North Island, has erupted numerous times since this event as well, with a pretty big eruption occurring about 1800 years ago. After this, very little is visible until we reach the northern parts of the North Island, primarily due to agriculture. Because when we begin to break free from human influence, we see familiar shapes that we've seen in other places around the world time and time again, albeit with more vegetative growth in certain areas. So after this awesome titanomagnetite mine here, which is a mineral containing oxides of titanium and iron that were deposited by the volcanism here, the evidence begins. And here's the first site. We can see chevrons just north of the plantation here, but just west of it, we see a familiar site. And here it is. The direction of it perfectly corresponding to the epicenter of the crater much like every other deposit does. I believe this area hasn't had a chance to recover, like the parts to the west of it have, due to its location. But as we move away from it, we see exactly what we saw in South America. 
only vegetation has regrown here. Now the vast majority of these are chevrons, and we're back into familiar terrain, with it looking exactly as we'd expect. And here you can see something very cool. The chevrons are on either side here, with a flow that went inland and deposited sediment on this thin strip over here. I wonder what this looked like before it was turned into farmland. It must have been pretty damn epic. It appears the wave swept over this entire stretch of land, with chevrons deposited en masse on the opposite side. There's no mistake in it though, these are chevrons from a tsunami without a doubt. It really hammered this part of the North Island. And here we are, at the very tip of the North Island. The place with the most evidence of the mega tsunami. It's swept over from one side to the other, inundating this entire strip of land. The chevrons here are so clear and evident, and it's pretty intense to see this, because this same level of damage hit every single location in New Zealand's western facing shorelines. But here, where the land flattens, is where we find the best depositions relating to the Burkle Crater Mega Tsunami. And at this point, I think we've finally ended our massive journey. Aside from a few islands here and there, we have truly gone to every single place that was in the direct firing line of the Burkle Comet impact. And we've also looked at areas that were in the indirect firing line as well. At every single location, without fail, we have found chevrons where we'd expect them to be, in the correct orientation and direction, with pronounced tears and scarring in the land. And in some places, clear signs of vegetative damage that still hasn't recovered fully, even to this day, was also seen. This pronounced wave damage is rife, stretching from one part of the globe all the way to the very opposite. This event was truly cataclysmic. And now, all that remains is the ability to put the boots on the ground, and to actually go out there and take the samples from these locations, so that we can finally turn this theory into a proven event. Thanks for watching.